Good morning, uh, everyone, on this wonderful day in Prague. Uh, I'm Anne McElvoy from Politico, and thank you for joining us here for this <coughs> keynote Politico event and a podcast recording in the wonderful setting of the British Embassy. Our guest today isn't someone you'll hear on too many chat shows. He's yet to launch his own live uh, podcast, and he's usually more the silent type. So we're very pleased to welcome the head of MI6, Sir Richard Moore, otherwise known as C. Richard is giving what will be his only public speech this year to us today. So you're going to hear that. And then we will uh, dive into an interview. And for now, it's over to you, Richard. Thank you, Anne. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Your Excellencies, uh, Ministers, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm delighted to be uh, in Prague and to be visiting uh, such a close friend and ally of the United Kingdom. In particular, I'm grateful to be joined today uh, by my friends and colleagues in the Czech intelligence uh, services with whom we have an outstanding partnership. It was here in this beautiful capital almost exactly 55 years ago on the 18th of July 1968 that Alexander Dubček broadcast to the nation at a moment of supreme crisis. Millions were daring to hope that the libera liberalizing reforms of the Prague Spring would genuinely change what that great Czech, Václav Havel, would later call the contaminated moral environment of communist rule. Dubček voiced that optimism by saying, and I quote, we shall finish the democratic process that we have begun. Today, after many years, people can come out openly without fear for their opinions. Those were fateful words because we know what happened next. One month and two days later, columns of Russian tanks rolled through the streets around us, reimposing by brute force another generation of oppression on the Czech people before they finally regained their freedom. No one described those years with greater skill or originality than the late Milan Kunda, a giant of European literature whose passing we all mourn. So, any visiting British official should come to the Czech Republic in a spirit of humility, particularly when Russian tanks have once again invaded a European nation. Our Czech friends know better than we British ever will the realities of dictatorship and the bleak, pitiless mentality of conquest and domination that lay behind the tragedy of 1968 and drives Vladimir Putin today. Not surprisingly, the Czech Republic was among the very first countries in Europe to come to Ukraine's aid with essential military supplies and has continued to show extraordinary humanitarian generosity to the Ukrainian people. And I take heart from the uplifting fact that no amount of force or repression in four decades of tyranny could overcome the courage and dignity of the Czech people. Just as Putin is discovering that nothing he can do in Ukraine will break that nation's will to resist and triumph. And it's the human factor, intangible but vital, that I want to concentrate upon today in my second public speech in this role. My service is surrounded by mythology, not all of which I would wish to dispel. <laughs> the human factor by Graham Greene is a rather fine but not very flattering novel about my profession and my service. But the title is undeniably accurate because my service exists to create and nurture one of the most extraordinary and highly charged human relationships, the unique bond of trust between agents overseas and the intelligence officers who work with them. Recruiting and running those agents in the toughest and most inhospitable places on earth is what we do. That is our core business, what no one else in the British government can do. Courageous men and women from other nations choose to make common cause with us, often at immense risk, and everything depends on forging a relationship of empathy, confidence, and understanding. We have to maintain secrecy, not as an end in itself, 
but because the lives of our agents and the effectiveness of our work depend upon it. And we never forget that the very best human qualities are found in all nations. There were many Russians in 1968 who saw the moral travesty of what was being done here in Prague. They had no wish to be on the wrong side of history. And the bravest of them acted on their convictions by throwing in their lot with us as partners for freedom. There are many Russians today who are silently appalled by the sight of their armed forces pulverizing Ukrainian cities, expelling innocent families from their homes, and kidnapping thousands of children. They're watching in horror as their soldiers ravage a kindred country. They know in their hearts that Putin's case for attacking a fellow Slavic nation is fraudulent, a miasma of lies and fantasy. One architect of that onslaught, Yevgeny Prigozhin, demolished the whole charade in a single sentence when he said, and I quote, the war was needed for Shoigu to receive a hero star. The oligarchic clan that rules Russia needed the war. He added, and I stress, these were his words, not mine. The mentally ill scumbags decided, it's okay, we'll throw in a few thousand more Russian men as cannon fodder. They'll die under artillery fire, but we'll get what we want. A few hours after saying that, Prigozhin was marching on Moscow, leading a mutiny which exposed the inexorable decay of the unstable autocracy over which Putin presides. As they witnessed the venality, infighting, and sheer callous incompetence of their leaders, the human factor at its worst, many Russians are wrestling with the same dilemmas and the same tugs of conscience as their predecessors did in 1968. I invite them to do what others have already done this past 18 months and join hands with us. Our door is always open. We will handle their offers of help with the discretion and professionalism for which my service is famed. Their secrets will always be safe with us. And together, we will work to bring the bloodshed to an end. My service lives by the principle that our loyalty to our agents is lifelong and our gratitude eternal. One of my earlier acts as C was to repatriate the ashes of a woman who had died just after turning 100, having worked for SIS by penetrating German intelligence, the Abwehr, in Lisbon in 1944. She was codenamed Ecclesiastic, and in her retirement, generations of MI6 officers helped to look after her. We have a picture of her, photographing what was ostensibly a British top secret document in a deception operation that successfully fooled the German high command. Nearly 80 years later, we gathered in honor of Ecclesiastic to scatter her ashes in the English Channel, within sight of where the Allied fleet sailed from Portsmouth to liberate Europe and end a catastrophic conflict. In the same way, today's ruinous war will only truly end when a sovereign Ukraine lives in freedom. To bring forward that moment, Ukraine's armed forces are now on the offensive, demonstrating their astonishing ability to innovate and mobilize new technology. Last summer at the Aspen Security Conference, I noted that the Russian effort appeared to be running out of steam. It was, and there appears now to be little prospect of the Russian forces regaining momentum. In the last month, Ukraine has liberated more territory than Russia captured in the last year. At this moment in the conflict, it's even more vital for Ukraine's friends to press on and sustain their support so that Ukrainian valor on the battlefield continues to find its counterpart in the enduring will of allied countries to arm, provision, and train them for as long as it takes, to quote the emphatic communique of the NATO summit in Vilnius. Some nations, by contrast, have reduced themselves to being accomplices of the aggressor. Iran's decision to supply Russia with the suicide drones that meet out random destruction to Ukraine's cities, has provoked internal quarrels at the highest level of the regime in Tehran. 
and so it should, because that decision was unconscionable. Iran seeks cash by selling arms to Russia to enable them to kill Ukrainian soldiers and civilians. Russia, in turn, seeks cash by hawking their mercenaries around Africa. In some African nations, burdened by civil war, poverty, and a weak state, Russia has offered a 21st century version of a Faustian pact. The essential bargain is that Wagner mercenaries will keep the government of that country in power, provided that it signs over to Russia or to Russian individuals privilege rights to its people's mineral wealth. The leaders of the Central African Republic were the first to strike this deal, followed by the military regime in Mali. And others, perhaps the contenders for power in Sudan or the new rulers of Burkina Faso may be next. But now they've had to watch the very mercenaries who they are supposed to trust turning against their ultimate patron, Vladimir Putin, and bearing down on Moscow. If Russian mercenaries can betray Putin, who else might they betray? If they can advance on Moscow, what other capitals might they threaten? And what if Prigozhin was right when he said this about Russia's policy in Africa? We were told that Africa was needed, and after that, it was abandoned, because all the money that was intended for aid was stolen. The truth is that Russia has no interest in peace or stability in African countries. On the contrary, its strategy for influence requires active conflicts and weak states, which the Kremlin views as targets to be controlled and exploited in a new Russian imperialism. Yet for all the immediate challenges posed by Putin's aggression, Russia is not the single most important strategic focus of my service. We now devote more resources to China than anywhere else, reflecting China's increasing global significance. As the Foreign Secretary said in April, Britain will robustly defend our national security and values. But at the same time, it's absolutely necessary to engage with China for the simple reason that not a single international problem of any importance can be addressed if we do not. We have watched China steadily expand its influence in contested spaces by offering countries ambitious deals that look too good to be true and frequently turn out to be exactly that. For example, control of data is vital for national sovereignty. Governments have a duty to safeguard the data generated by their citizens and by national projects, whether in health or infrastructure. If you hand over your data to another state, you risk ensnaring yourself in a data trap that will dilute your sovereignty and leave you vulnerable. When China was selling COVID vaccines around the world, it often ensured that recipient countries would have to share their vaccination data sets with Beijing. That is exactly the kind of condition in any deal which should ring alarm bells. Authoritarian regimes try to hide their intentions in contested spaces within a blizzard of propaganda and disinformation. They are increasingly doing this with the aid of artificial intelligence, which is opening up vast new terrains for fake news, blurring the distinction between fantasy and reality. This brings me back to the core business of my service. In a world ever more awash with disinformation and fakery, the premium on discovering the truth with accurate, verified reporting from human agents and technical operations will be even greater. AI is going to make information infinitely more accessible, and some have asked whether it will put intelligence services like mine out of business. In fact, the opposite is likely to be true. As AI trawls the ocean of open source, there will be ever greater value in landing with a well-cast fly the secrets that lie beyond the reach of its nets. The unique characteristics of human agents in the right places will become still more significant. They are never just passive collectors of information. Our agents can be tasked and directed. They can identify new questions we didn't know to ask. And sometimes they can influence decisions inside a government or terrorist group. Human intelligence in the age of artificial intelligence will increasingly be defined as those things that machines cannot do. Albeit, we should expect the frontiers of machine capability to advance with startling speed. 
My teams are now using AI to augment, but not replace, their own judgment about how people might act in various situations. They're combining their skills with AI and bulk data to identify and disrupt the flow of weapons to Russia for use against Ukraine. In future, as AI begins to overtake some aspects of human cognition, it's possible that digital tools may come to understand, or rather to be able to predict, human behavior better than humans can. But there will always be an extraordinary bond that allows one person genuinely to confide in another, united by a sense of common humanity and purpose, the essence of the human factor. However swift and all-encompassing the advance of AI, some relationships are going to stay uniquely, stubbornly human. And those relationships are at the heart of my service because my agency is dedicated to preserving human agency. So what we do is going to remain vital, but how we do it must continually adapt to harness AI's burgeoning opportunities and counter its threats. I expect that we will increasingly be tasked with obtaining intelligence on how hostile states are using AI in damaging, reckless, and unethical ways. I know that we can only protect our citizens if we understand the essence of the threat while embracing AI's undoubted potential for good. So let me say with clarity and conviction, my service, together with our allies, intends to win the race to master the ethical and safe use of AI. It's true that other countries have inherent advantages which we will never be able to match or would never wish to. China benefits from sheer scale. AI in its current form requires colossal volumes of data. The more data you have, the more rapidly you can teach machine learning tools. China has added to its immense data sets at home by hoovering up others abroad. And the Chinese authorities are not hugely troubled by questions of personal privacy or individual data security. They are focused on controlling information and preventing inconvenient truths from being revealed. But speaking for the United Kingdom intelligence community, we have advantages too. Our people, inspired by their mission, our values, entrepreneurial and democratic, our technology, ingenious and leading edge, our partnerships based on friendship, not transactions all combining to maximize our creativity. We cannot, in all honesty, be sure where the advance of AI will take us, but we can strike out in a spirit of optimism with a willingness to cooperate. And I remain hopeful that our common humanity and our shared interest in understanding the power of AI may yet lead to agreement on global coordination on which our Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is leading the way. China's draft AI regulations emphasize the importance of veracity, accuracy, objectivity, and diversity. I can only say we agree. Let's make those fine words a reality, not a slogan. For our part, SIS is fortunate to serve a country with a greater concentration of tech companies, world-class universities, and research centers than anywhere else in Europe. And this is where all free societies and the agencies that protect them enjoy the biggest inherent advantage of all. Through openness, debate, and the dynamic exchange of ideas, we excel at liberating the talents of our people. Because as John Stuart Mill said, genius can only breathe freely in an atmosphere of freedom. The Czech people showed 55 years ago that nothing can ever suppress humanity and freedom, which together bestow a unique competitive edge and our duty is to make the most of it. Thank you. We have a marvelous uh, high tech pause just uh, now because we are going to debuild the lectern, avoid the piano, and I'm going to sit down to interview Richard, so if you just tweet along and uh, give us uh, half a minute or so to do that. Thank you.
talk about your experiences of 1968 and 1989 and of course here in this setting in Prague brings me as someone who was you know, here at the time in, in 89, I was a very young journalist obviously, but uh, one of the, th the things that I suppose I've reflected on coming back now is that that was a moment of great hope. 1968, which you also chose as your starting point, mm. uh, was a moment when there appeared to be the hope of, of reform communism uh, in that period. Uh, of course, both of those things, in a sense, led to, to different kinds of, of disappointments uh, and challenges. So what do you make of the significance uh, of the city when you walk these wonderful cobbled stones and your memories come back? Well, I mean, you're right, aren't you, that um, the Prague Spring was a false dawn um, and, it, and the, the real dawn came a generation later. Uh, I, I accept that. I think um, the reason for... I mean, I was coming to Prague anyhow uh, because uh, I wanted to visit and we have um, extraordinarily good, close partnerships with, uh, with our uh, Czech friends here. But when we were thinking about me coming here, it seemed a very good place to speak about Ukraine in particular uh, and the, because the parallels are so strong, aren't they? This is the last European country to see Russian tanks rolling across its border. Uh, that is uh, where Ukraine finds itself. And as I tried to set out in the speech, um, the crushing of the Prague Spring was a very important moment for, for my service, for MI6, in our history, because uh, several Russians decided that that was, the, that was the breaking point for them, the point at which they decided to move against their own system, and they came to us and offered their help. And so I'm for both those parallels, it seemed a really appropriate place to come and uh, talk about these issues. We, we uh, might delve into that offer that you've, you've made uh, for mm. those disaffected with the Putin uh, regime to, to call, call a number um, or, or get in, in touch in, in just a moment. But I'd, I'd like to just start by your assessment on Ukraine and the counteroffensive. Now, it is proceeding, I think, even according to those who are very supportive of Ukraine with difficulty and slowly. It's a massively difficult thing to, to take back uh, territory in those circumstances against uh, Russian forces. We see drone attacks <coughs> stepping up. Politico has uh, reported a massive impending attack in Kharkiv by Russia. Why are you so confident uh, of the chances of Ukraine uh, prevailing? And you know, what sort of time frame are you thinking that we could really see a breakthrough? Well, it's a, it's a hard grind, and uh, you know, Ukrainian uh, uh, officials and military uh, don't shy away from that. We don't, uh, you know, that is very clear. And the Russians have had uh, a chance to put in defences which are very tough to overcome. But uh, I, I do return to that point uh, I made, um, that even though Ukrainian commanders, rather in rather stark contrast to their Russian counterparts, uh, want to preserve the lives of their troops uh, and therefore move uh, with due uh, caution, uh, they have still made more, recovered more territory in a month than the Russians managed to achieve in a year. So I do remain uh, uh, optimistic about it. I think the resolve to support the Ukrainians is as strong as it ever was. And therefore, you know, our job is to focus on why we're all doing this. We're doing this because Putin launched a war of aggression on Ukraine uh, over a year and a half ago. Um, and actually, if, if you think about it, if you think back to February uh, 2022, the idea that you and I, Anne, would be discuss discussing not, not just the first, but the second uh, offensive mounted by the Ukrainians would have seen for the birds. And so I think they've done remarkably well. One has to put it in proper context, but I think uh, I do remain optimistic. Uh, uh, do you mean, when you, when you talk about U Ukraine prevailing, what you and uh, your service is supporting, do you mean regaining all of its territory, including so pre-2014, including Crimea? Well, most uh, conflicts end in some kind of negotiation. It is for Ukraine to define the terms of peace, not us. Our job is to try and put them in the strongest possible position uh, to negotiate from, from a position of strength, and that's what we're intent uh, on doing.
Can you shed any light on the level of support that the UK and its allies are giving Ukraine in the way of intelligence? I know you're not going to do massive detail here, but where I think there are concerns, it is really the use of intelligence to support potential attacks now, according to the Kremlin, which has been very much you know, on his high horse about it this week, not least after the attack on the bridge at the Kerch Straits, is that this intelligence, which is being then used to target Russian assets, including they would say in Russian or Russian held territory is coming from British and American intelligence and that risks escalation. What's your response? Well, it's very flattering um, that President Putin thinks that my service is behind all of this, um, but it's, it's really um, a bit more prosaic. You know, we have been very clear, the UK has been very clear that we will support uh, the Ukraine to defend itself, and that's what we're doing. It is, um, it is Putin who has invaded Ukraine. They are absolutely right to exercise their right of self-defense, and it's absolutely clear that we will help them uh, through both uh, provision of military material, but also uh, in any other way uh, to try and recover their territory that they've lost. We've seen the aborted uh, rebellion by the Wagner Group, the confusion about the status of Yevgeny uh, Prigozhin and this sort of on-off relationship uh, with Vladimir Putin and possibly a deal uh, with Belarus. I mean, what Ktorkavo in the great old Russian saying, I think it's Lenin, that one, isn't it? Who, whom, who's got power over whom? How are you reading it? Well, it, it is an extraordinary set of events. At the end of the day, what goes on inside Russia is, um, is up to the Russians and down to the Russians. But I have to say that day that we saw, that, that particular Saturday when Prigozhin made his move, uh, his sort of extended road trip uh, through Rostov and, and approaching Moscow, it was extraordinary. If you, if you look at Putin's behaviors on that day, uh, Prigozhin started off, I think, as a traitor at breakfast. Uh, he had been pardoned by supper, and then a few days later he was invited for tea. So there are some things, Anne, that even the chief of MI6 finds it a little bit difficult to try and interpret in terms of who's in and who's out. Uh, it would help if you had sources in the Wagner group, do you? Uh, so I obviously don't talk about uh, where we have sources, but um, it, it, I don't think it was a particular surprise, was it, when Prigozhin made his mood. He had been telegraphing. Uh, w with pretty violent language, his disaffection with uh, Shoigu and Gerasimov, the uh, defense minister and the chief of general staff of Russia. And so when he finally blew his top uh, and, and made his move, uh, it wasn't that as much of a surprise. It also, I would say, is a real indication of how uh, Putin can't contain uh, the impact of his invasion of Ukraine within the borders of Ukraine. And what we're seeing here is, if you like, the instability caused by uh, the appalling uh, casualties that the Russians are suffering on the battlefield, sort of bleeding back into the Russian body politic in a, in a potentially destabilizing so way. So how do you assess Putin's state of mind? I mean, you, you said well, this is mysterious, uh, the Prigozhin to and fro, even mm. to you, but you must look very closely and, and be well informed, uh, not least through through your, your secret operatives of the, the perception of Putin's state of mind. You, everyone remembers that story that he tells himself about you know, fighting the cornered rat and the rat corners him and he, he fights back. The, the, the doubt, I suppose, that that raises for a lot of people is like, are you dealing with someone who is either desperate or, you know, to, to use the sort of common language about it, a bit mad and prepared to go all the way to hang on to power? How do you assess him? Well, I, I think we are reasonably well placed as, as we were able to and demonstrate in the run-up to the war, um, he is clearly under pressure. You, you don't have uh, a, a group of mercenaries advance up the motorway towards Moscow and get to within 125 uh, kilometers of Moscow uh, unless you have not quite predicted that, that was going to happen. So um, I, I think he probably feels under uh, some pressure. Um, Prigozhin was his creature. Um, utterly created by Putin, and yet he turned on him. Yeah, we, we, sorry, I'll just move it along a bit. We kind yeah. of know that, so, yeah. uh, as we, you know, we're informed as such. But uh, the question is, what is his state of mind as you understand it? And do you believe that, the, to the point about the danger of escalation, that you might be actually mm. dealing with someone who is prepared to go on and do unthinkable uh, things? And obviously the nuclear question hovers over this because 
he fights back. He fought back hard against Prigozhin. Whatever you know, whatever the deal, he's still there. He's still in the Kremlin. And What's he, he thinking? And he, he really didn't fight back against Prigozhin. He cut a deal to save his skin, using the good offices of the uh, uh, of the leader of, uh, of of Belarus. So, uh, look, I, even I can't see inside uh, Putin's um, head. But uh, the the only person who has been, I would say, well, the only people uh, who have been talking about uh, escalation and nuclear weapons are Putin and a handful of henchmen uh, around him. That is irresponsible, it's reckless, and it is designed to, to try and weaken our resolve in supporting Ukraine, and it will not work. And I was really encouraged, and you will have seen this as well, to see a group of uh, senior Russians and academics sort of push back against some of this ridiculous and dangerous rhetoric. Now, your message to those who would be having doubts uh, about Putin at a senior level, possibly inside the intelligence uh, uh, community in Russia, is uh, come to us, come uh, to, uh, to MI6. Now, the, the, that's a, a, an open-handed offer, I suppose. It's always there from intelligence services. As you know, I kind of Indeed. wrote memoirs of Marcus Wolf on the other side, and it's always a push and pull of who can uh, attract each other's assets or, or turn agents or get new sources. But, you know, there's also a kind of elephant in the room here. I mean, some people would say, well, you know, what, like Sergei Skripal, that didn't go so well. You said in your speech that this was a lifelong commitment to those who came to work uh, with you and the secrets would be, be safe. But what would you say to those who say, well, in some circumstances, that has not turned out to be easy to deliver on? The truth is that people continue uh, to come to us, Anne. And uh, of course, in, do, in doing so, they, they take risk. But as I uh, articulated to you, we look after the people who come and work with us. And of course, our successes are never known. Well, um, well can you just give us a sense of the scale of your successes? Even if this is your moment to make them a bit more known. Are you seeing a pattern of people coming to you who may be in any sort of numbers who would not have done so before the invasion of I, uh, Ukraine. I, I use that uh, parallel with the crushing of the Prague Spring advisedly because now is a time where we are seeing Russians who are totally appalled by what they're seeing done in their name uh, in Ukraine and uh, therefore it's a moment where people uh, are looking to come and help us and there's nothing to do about uh, what's going on in, in Russia. What, what happens in Russia is, is down to Russians ultimately but uh, what they can do is to help us to bring the bloodshed in Ukraine to an end by helping us to support the Ukraine. And you're sure you can protect them or that the security services of course also MI5 that, can protect them? That, that is our sacred trust. If, uh, you know, if we could not do that, we would go out of business. And I can assure you, Anne, we are very much in business. We have a question from our Welt and co uh, colleagues in Berlin. There's been a, a major leak from the German intelligence service, the, the BND. That was a very senior level and someone has been, been arrested. And uh, that is you know, under investigation by the German authorities. Does this make British and American intelligence less confident in their willingness to share information with other intelligence services, even among uh, allies who are crucial in this period, like Germany? Well, I think perhaps my worst nightmare would be to wake up one morning and, and find that we had uh, a traitor inside SIS. We've been there before in the 1950s and 1960s with Philby and Blunt, uh, etc. And it is hugely damaging. So my, my first reaction when these things happen is to feel some empathy uh, for the situation of my partner and to support them because I hope that's how they would act towards us. So. Um, you know, that, that's the approach I take on this. Uh, the German intelligence service are uh, outstanding partners of, of ours and we continue to work extremely uh, well with I them. I think the concern is, more broadly, is about the degree of sympathy for, ongoing sympathy for Russia in certain parts of German institutional life. I think isn't, that's the sort of sense of that question as well. Uh, isn't it? I, I don't detect it and uh, it, it, it's easy to forget because we move on too quickly perhaps sometimes just what a profound move in German foreign and defense policy happened post the invasion of Ukraine and I see that 
manifested in the approach of their intelligence services. Let's move on but to, to China and AI, which I definitely want to, to cover with you, so I'm afraid it is it's going to be a bit, uh, it's a bit quick fire. Um, the UK's Parliament uh, Intelligence and Security Committee reported only last week on Chinese interference and influence uh, in the UK and issued a pretty damning verdict. The UK, it said, had no strategy to tackle Beijing's growing threat to the country's commercial, academic and national security. Well, that's quite a lot, isn't it? Uh, in your first uh, speech in post, you said that China was the single greatest priority for MI6 and you warned about miscalculation at over uh, uh, confidence uh, in dealings with Beijing and, and of course, uh, the looming uh, threat of a possible invasion of, of Taiwan. So, <laughs> put these things together, it does look a bit like uh, the UK authorities, and not only the UK, have been a bit asleep at the wheel on China. Your thoughts? Well, the, the Intelligence Services Committee, the um, Independent Scrutiny uh, Committee of Parliament that oversees our work, uh, a key difference between us and, uh, and, say, the Chinese services, has produced a really comprehensive, thorough report, and I, it deserves a proper, full response, and it'll get that from the government in, in due course. Uh, I, I would just repeat what I said, uh, and you just said back to me, that uh, we now devote more resources to China than any other uh, mission. Uh, that reflects China's importance uh, in the world and, the, imp and the, the crucial need to understand both the intent and capability of the Chinese government. So, you know, from our perspective, it feels to me that we are very much awake at the wheel on China. And do you believe that there's a kind of axis of interrelated threats, the linkage of China with Russia, but also um, Iran, they're, they're kind of in, in the mix as effectively as, as a supporter of disruption to the, the Western system? I think views vary on how much to take these uh, states, these very big autocratic states, se uh, separately, or how much you believe in a modern, if I can uh, bring back a, an old phrase, the axis of evil, perhaps with slightly different players. Well... Those three countries are sort of pushing themselves together. It's not like anybody else is pushing them together, and um, Iran has chosen to, uh, presumably to earn cash, as well as probably to receive some military uh, uh, know-how in return to support the Russians. The Chinese have uh, lent very heavily in support of uh, Russia since the outset of Ukraine, despite the fact that, uh, of course, in his invasion of Ukraine, Putin tramples over two really critical uh, international uh, uh, principles, those of, uh, of national sovereignty and those of territorial integrity, which the Chinese government proclaims to be ones that it believes in, and yet very clearly it's taken the side of Russia. So, I, it, you know, this is happening because uh, I think particularly in the case of uh, Russia and Iran, they're kind of running out of options. So the, the main option for them is to go running to Beijing. I think the, the underlying theme of your speech, which I found very interesting, having sort of seen things that one didn't think could sort of fall apart, fall apart, both for good and ill, is fragility. Do you believe the Communist Party of China itself is fragile? Do you think in, in uh, anything like we can predict, we might actually see a real challenge to the Communist Party as the central organising principle? Well, China is uh, an extraordinarily complex, complicated uh, country. It's a country, of course, with a fantastic history and culture. Um, and we will continue to, to monitor it closely. As I say, it's the thing we devote more uh, effort to than any other, and uh, we will look across the range of factors um, uh, around China. But in particular, you know, we do that because the UK wants to defend its uh, values and interests, and where they collide with, uh, with China, we want to be in the best possible position to defend those interests and values. You've made a strong claim uh, th this morning about values and superior values. There will be, of course, those who say, well, the UK and uh, other Western countries must be careful to take the moral high ground given that it has welcomed Russian money and influence into the economy. It's left behind unstable regimes in botched campaigns in Iraq and was uh, part of, although of course uh, led by the Americans, a rather chaotic departure from uh, Af Afghanistan. I mean, what makes you feel that you can say with confidence that people sort of calling you out for hypocrisy or just cherry picking that the ethics and values that MI6 stand for are reflected in broader outcomes? The values uh, that we hold in MI6 are absolutely core to our sense of ourselves. They're core to the extraordinary men and women who work uh, for, for my service. So I'm never going to apologize for um, talking about the importance of those to our work. 
But it's really important to come back, Anne, to um, you know, what we are talking about here. We're talking about a wholesale act of aggression against a European country in breach of international law, accompanied by the most appalling litany of atrocities and inhumanity. And we really ought to be focusing, I think, on that and the other threats that uh, are posed. Uh, just just a, a, a last thought. You, I know you've committed very much to diversification of the service. You've mm -hmm. supported that uh, in terms of having many, many more uh, senior senior women. And you said very clearly that you want to see a lot of people come to the, the, the service who maybe don't think that, that it would be the, the right place for them. I notice also you've added uh, he, him to your Twitter bio, or someone has. <laughs> Um, why have you done that when a lot of people are quite sceptical of officials wading into pronoun wars? I suppose I'm asking if MI6 has gone a bit woke. Uh, I, I can say to you very comprehensively that uh, MI6 doesn't do culture wars. Uh, um, but what I do want is for um, my service to better represent the country we serve. Uh, that's a noble aim, in my view, but it's also an intensely practical aim. Uh, diversity brings um, greater creativity, better problem solving, all the things that we know very clearly in the literature that it brings. And particularly for uh, around issues around groupthink, it's a known risk for an intelligence, office, uh, intelligence service. So it's very powerful. And then if you add the rather obvious point that if you have officers of ethnic minority, they might just give you some cultural insight that you might otherwise lack, as well as perhaps not looking like me um, on the streets of, uh, of um, uh, other, some other parts of the world. Um, but I just wanted to say, if I may, on, on the AI uh, side of things, because I didn't pick that up from your last question. I just want to say this. There is obviously an application for us in our business around AI, and I could give you a sort of simple use case. You know, one of our jobs is to mm. sift through data and find people who might help us, of the type I was describing, and AI will undoubtedly help with that. But far more important to me is that uh, there's absolutely no doubt that some of our adversaries will be prepared to develop AI in ways which are reckless and dangerous. You spoke about nuclear rhetoric earlier yeah. on. And that worries us, and therefore it will be a significant part of our role going forward into the future to try and uncover and de you know, detect, uncover, and then disrupt people who would like to develop AI in, in directions which are You're dangerous. You're fighting for us. fire with fire on the AI front. No, I, not at all. I think it's that point I made in the speech that, about the human factor. It's really important that we work to preserve human agency over the technologies that we're developing. And not all actors out there may approach this with the same degree of responsibility that, that we in the UK do or people in this room might. Thank you, Sir Richard Moore, and to our guests uh, here in Prague for this exclusive Politico event. Uh, we'll say goodbye now to our viewers online. If you want to go back and have a, a listen, we will be making it available as a podcast. Please do go and search for our new podcast, Power Play, in your favourite podcast app and follow or subscribe to Power Play, which will be hosted by me and Mikhail Voy. And you'll get this interview as well as all future episodes when we officially launch in September. So we hope that uh, you, all of you here today and watching online will be our first listeners. It's goodbye from us.